one gets the sense from your descriptions that as we live our conventional lives within what we think of as a normal, healthy being, that it's really a very narrow range of abilities. So you describe, for example, a man who who discovered for a period of a few weeks the, the ability to smell like a dog. And, uh -huh. and he entered into a whole new world of smells. That, that it, and there's so many worlds like these that, that are available to people. Um, uh, incidentally, that particular story, which was the last one in the, in the hat book, I should say was written in San Francisco and was, was stimulated by the smell of eucalyptus here. I, I often find that I need some sort of um, This was a, a young medical student who had been uh, experimenting with speed amphetamines. Uh, and uh, he rather suddenly went into a, a strange state uh, in which he found his sense of smell immensely increased. And uh, he found he could recognize everybody he knew by smell, that he could find his way around New York by smell. Uh, and he found himself in of smell, which are tremendously uh, evocative and immediate. Every street and every building had a different smell. And this lasted for about three weeks, mm -hmm. and then, then it disappeared. And when it occurred, life seemed uh, tremendously real and immediate, and sort of concrete, and he felt rather like a dog. Uh, when all this dis uh, it was difficult for him to think abstractly because of the pressure of of the concrete because of smells calling to him, pressing on him all around. Then when it went away, he sort of felt a, a mixed sense of regret and relief. But certainly one of the interesting things is this. He couldn't have had this had it not been latent in him. And, uh, and if this power of smell was latent in him, it's probably latent in everybody. Mm -hmm. The sense of smell is probably repressed or suppressed in all of us. Uh, Freud thought this was so, uh, perhaps partly on the basis of, of assuming an upright posture, perhaps uh, on the basis of repressing uh, um, some of the smells associated with pregenital sexuality. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, whatever the explanation is, uh, as civilized adults, so-called, <laughs> we, uh, we don't seem to smell nearly as well as children, as animals, and as savages, mm -hmm. and perhaps perhaps we've renounced some of uh, some of our sense of smell. Uh, I don't know whether this is a whether it's worth it or not. There's a, there's a wonderful novel called called Perfume, which is a, an extraordinary imagination of a of a sort of olfactory genius, a sort of Mozart of the nose, whose whole world is smell. But but yes, in general. Um, I feel this very much from some patients and subjects I'm working with now who have a thing called Tourette syndrome. Um, I think that, uh, as it were, allowed uh, adult human nature is considerably smaller and more routinized than, than it might be. The Tourette syndrome, this is where people have nervous tics. Yeah, there tend to be sudden violent movements and tics and, mm -hmm. and, and impulses and exclamations and vocalizations. Um, and it's often associated or maybe associated with great bursts of creativity. Um, well, it, it, it can go with it. Uh, in general, the mind is, is swifter. Ex uh, associations can be accelerated. Things can be noticed at great speed. Sometimes one has the feeling of people with Tourette syndrome moving and, and fast forward. Uh, the question is then, really, whether they can hold together and whether they can c integrate themselves and compose themselves and compose anything else un under such a pressure of, of impulse. It can tear them apart, but it can also, um, uh, it can also sort of, uh, uh, I think, dispose to unusual achievement athletically, artistically. You write of, of one episode, I think it may have lasted less than two minutes, and as I recall, you say that it, you learned more, it moved you more than perhaps any other two-minute period in your entire life when in the streets of New York, I believe, you witnessed a, a, a oh. woman who had this syndrome. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, she was she was um, impersonating. Uh, Impersonating sounds too conscious and too deliberate. There was a sort of convulsive taking on of the movements and the repertoires, the voices, the faces of everyone who passed her. And this was done within, within a few seconds, so that about 50 of these were done within two or three minutes. And then obviously the pressure of, uh, of all this was too much for her, and she turned aside, she turned into a little alley, and, and there was a, had a sort of egurgitation, a sort of vomiting out at, at high speed of, of the faces and the personae of these people whom she'd sort of incorporated. Um, in, uh, I think that one often, um, I mean, the, uh, non, the clinic itself and the usual conditions of medical observation, I think, can, can limit uh, what one sees. And, uh, uh, and especially for something like Tourette's syndrome, which, which depends so much on, on impulse and interaction, mm -hmm. sometimes a very strange sort. You have to see it in real life, uh, which is why at the moment my present work has taken me out of the clinic a bit to traveling the country with a friend of mine who has Tourette's and sort of looking at the extraordinary Tourettic world, the sort of uh, the strange fraternity of Tourettes who seem to be scattered through the States. But certainly, um, uh, Tourette's can show one a very much broader spectrum of human nature, and in particular of what one might call the primitive in human nature, than uh, uh, than some people feel comfortable with. And at one time, the medical profession had virtually assumed that uh, that all of the cases had disappeared, even doubted the existence of the syndrome. Yes, it's. Uh, it was originally described a century ago by Gilles de la Tourette. There were a lot of cases described in the last century, and, and, the, and then around 1905 or so, these descriptions stopped. As a medical student and a resident, I'd scarcely heard of it. It was said to be extremely rare and almost non-existent. And I saw my first patient with it in 71. The day after seeing him, I saw three people in the streets of New York with it and the day after that another two. And this, this sort of blew my mind because I thought um, I must have been, these people must have been there already. Was I seeing them or not seeing them? Was I seeing them and dismissing them as something else? I, I, wondered, if, um, I wondered if it could be a thousand times commoner than I'd supposed. Uh, I wondered if these people might recognize one another and form a sort of fraternal association, a Tourette mm -hmm. syndrome association. An underground. Right? An underground. And precisely this happened. Uh, there was a Tourette syndrome association just 30 strong in 1974, and now it's 110,000 strong. Well, it's as if maybe the, the, the syndrome has a cycle of activity, perhaps. No, no, no. I think this is entirely to do with, with recognition. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's now um, perceived to exist. Mm -hmm. People can say it. Uh, they, can, they can come out into the open. In the early part of the century, perhaps, the medical profession found this syndrome so uncomfortable they blinded yeah. themselves uh, to um, it. Well, it sort of transgresses the categories in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Uh, on the one hand, it seems to be physical and motor. There are odd muscle contractions and twitches. And on the other hand, there can be cursing, there can be blasphemies. Um, uh, the, 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 there can be sudden impulses to, to, to touch uh, and sometimes to hurt and to hurt oneself. And um, it is such a mixture of the, of the physical and the psychical that, that both neurologists and psychiatrists seem to be uncomfortable with it. And uh, uh, I mean, there's, um, I once got a letter from a man who said he had a tourtized soul. But I think there's almost nothing which, uh, which can show, uh, show one sort of the mutual influences of brain and mind as, as, as clearly as Tourette's. Uh, I mean, I love it for this reason because it, it unites the categories. But it, uh, when, when I think people often want to see them as separated, mm -hmm. and one has to unite the categories of brain and soul. Well, there's a sense, I suppose, in, in which one, one might think that these categories are artificial distinctions, that we're really dealing with one process, ultimately. Well, we're certainly dealing with, um, 
with organisms, with living beings. Um, and, uh, and perhaps we have to have anatomical and physiological descriptions on the one hand and, uh, and psychical descriptions on the other. Perhaps one has to have two universes of description and discourse. Um, but um, the question is then whether, whether they can be bridged, whether, the, whether they can come together. Some of the work that you describe uh, seems to defy not only the science of neurology, but even the more abstract disciplines of logic, like uh, you, you write about an incredible pair of twins who seem to have the ability to uh, apprehend prime numbers, huge prime uh -huh. numbers, just a a in an instant, at a glance. Uh, um, well, I... Um I hesitated to publish this because because it mystified me so much. I um, but I'm I'm no mathematician. I uh, I I assume they must have a method. Um, I um, I confess that in in that particular piece I did give rise give way to some uh, sort of Pythagorean mysticism or whatever, and I. I I compare the twins to to, to angels, uh, immediately intuiting things. But I, uh, but I think what what whatever is intuited must uh, uh, must have some sort of un underlying method. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, but certainly, um, uh, I find astonishment, the feeling of astonishment and wonder. Uh, are very much parts of, of, of you know, parts of my daily work, and, th and they need to be.